Teaching Tech is turning five years old. I think I've had some pretty good projects, but I also think the best is still to come. And I need your help to determine which comes next. In December of 2017, I decided to pour all of my spare time and effort into a new YouTube channel, Teaching Tech. I released the channel trailer in week one of January 2018, and five years later, here we are. Teaching Tech was started in the spare bedroom of our house with a couple of printers in the background, but as the channel grew and the printer collection too, it justified moving to a bigger room in the house, and then when we moved recently, setting up a dedicated studio space with a lot more storage. Here are the stats for those first five years of teaching tech. There has been approximately 450 videos and then Patreon exclusive videos on top of that. All of the videos have amassed approximately 60 million views, which is quite frankly mind boggling. And the channel is just about to pass 400,000 subscribers. YouTube content is one thing, but what I'm most pleased with is my website, mainly from the ability of the free calibration pages to assist many people. Although not as well known, the troubleshooting pages can be handy as well. In the future, I'd like to expand to version 3 and bring on some new functionality. For the last 5 years, whether creating videos or web pages, the philosophy has never changed. I always try to make the resources that I myself will be looking for when trying to learn about a topic. And that idea is what drives the structure and everything else that I create for the channel. I'm proud of my achievements, but they just wouldn't be possible without the acceptance of the community and the generous support of my patrons. So thank you very much to all of you. This video is not for bragging, however. I turned 40 earlier this year, and at the rate I'm going, I'm never going to finish some of my long-term projects. So I need your help in determining which ones I should focus on first. This first project you'll be seeing sooner rather than later. I previously created a video on designing and building a playground for our new miniature goats. And now that they're a little bit older and off the bottle, it's all about automating their setup. So I've been writing a lot of Arduino code and designing and building a bunch of custom parts. This project and video is all about backyard automation with a solar and battery powered off the grid control system. In the box is an Arduino compatible microcontroller and it gives me full control of the backyard. Connecting to the local Wi-Fi, this system gives me manual control over things like sprinkler systems, but even more powerful than that, I can automatically schedule events like feeding the goats three times a day so we can go out for the day or even on holidays without having to worry about it. The video will cover the required hardware and electronics, the design and CAD for the various systems, and a bunch of other things I learnt along the way, such as making outdoor waterproof wiring using special connectors. If you want all the hot tips for designing and making waterproof, complex internet connected devices for your yard, then this video will be for you. Project 2 relates to an electric go-kart that I previously featured on the channel. Now this thing is a lot of fun with crazy torque from the electric motor. The trouble is, with the motor in gearing as is, it tops out at 37 kilometers per hour or 23 miles per hour. So the project is to make it much faster. I've actually had all of the parts sitting around ready for some time now. The electric motor I've sourced this time is brushless. It has around twice the power of the existing motor, yet it has the exact same mounting pattern, which should make life easy. The hold up here is that I need to build a really large 18650 custom battery. I've already got all 320 cells. I covered the research and purchasing of these in my ultimate 18650 battery building guide video. And in that video, I also made a practice battery from secondhand laptop cells to power a 3D printer. I've also designed the first components of the battery, a modular monster that holds 320 cells. I've even started 3D printing some of the frame pieces. So really what I need is some encouragement to print the remaining parts and then spot weld all of the cells into their final configuration. The video will also include elements like the fitment and programming of the speed controller, the setup of a 500 amp capable battery management system, including Bluetooth, all of the other wiring, including cable management and likely some custom 3D printed parts, as well as how to calculate the correct gearing for your needs. As a bonus, all of the electronics in the cart are being completely replaced, and that means all of the existing electric running gear will be freed up. To find a new home in one of the oldest projects on the channel, this electric drift mobility scooter. 
which with the power of the existing go-kart is going to be a big handful. Essentially, this is a two-for-one project. In the past, I've made a series of videos on reclaiming waste-ready prints to recycle them into something new. Thanks to building a precious plastic shredder, that half of the equation is all worked out. But so far I've been limited in that the only thing I've been able to do with the ground up plastic was melt it into flat sheets for potential laser cutting. I did previously have a chance to test a pellet extruder, but the output was unreliable because my shredded filament was too large and irregular to nicely go down the hopper and into the melt zone. I'm very passionate about this cause, so earlier in the year I saved up and purchased a Protocycler Plus, what I hope is a high quality filament extruder. Earlier in the year, I filmed an exclusive behind the scenes video for my patrons, going over the machine, showing the setup process, and of course, making my first roll of custom PLA, this first spool from Virgin PLA pellets with colouring. After a few quite frankly ham-fisted attempts at getting the start of the filament spooled, I was able to successfully get the job going and create my first roll of PLA. And so far I'm quite pleased with the results. The filament is very consistent but slightly undersized, which means I need to run the calibration program which I was hoping to avoid. But then I moved house and it's been on the back burner ever since, sitting and waiting for me in a custom working and storage area for recycling filament. Besides calibration, the other thing I have to do is finish modifying this paper crosscut shredder, removing all of the safety features and putting a hopper on top to accept ground filament, the idea being that with the second pass through this, the ground filament will be much more consistent. And once that's done, I've been hoarding empty spools, ready to make a bunch of recycled PLA, thus completing my recycling center. The next project, let's say, is unusual, because it's to make my own, do-it-yourself, open-source claw machine. Do I need one of these? Absolutely not. But do I want to make one as a challenge? You better believe it. I have actually thought about this a lot, so here's the plan. Firstly, I want to make this as easy to manufacture as possible, so anyone as crazy as me can replicate it at home. So that means, like a kit Core XY 3D printer, many of the components will be 3D printed before being combined with traditional mounting hardware during assembly. I've already bought myself a bunch of 2020 extrusion ready to create the frame. My next goal is to use as many recycled 3D printer parts as possible, because if you're like me, you've got these lying around and they'll cost you nothing. So that means finally using some of the stepper motors I've been hoarding, as well as some of the spare belts I have and V-rollers. I'm also planning to run it all from a 3D printer mainboard, because my next goal is to use modified 3D printer firmware. The way I see it, just like a 3D printer, we have an X, Y and Z axis, and on top of that the addition of a claw that could be driven by a servo. All we need is a way to manually jog these, and then a homing sequence that will first home Z to lift up, and then home X and Y in the corner. To make the experience as authentic as possible, I've bought myself some arcade style switches and buttons, but anyone recreating could use whatever they had on hand. Next up, I want it to be secure enough to be safe when supervised. It's completely unrealistic for me to design it in a clear theft-proof enclosure as seen on a commercial claw machine. So I'll design mine to use cheap roofing materials on the outside, secure enough that people can't steal the toys as long as the machine is supervised. Finally, I'd like to be able to lend this claw machine to schools so they can use it for fundraising. So I've purchased this Arduino compatible coin collector, and one of the challenges will be interfacing it with the 3D printer firmware. Of course, I'll design this to be optional. I thought this project was pretty obscure, but the Plush Time Wins channel, whose footage you're watching now, is approaching 2 million subscribers, so maybe making my own claw machine isn't so crazy after all. I've made videos in the past, flirting with creating remote control aircraft on this channel, usually with the same results, promising at the start but ultimately ending in a crash. I did even try using the flight controller with a 3D printed experimental aerofoil, printed with only one or two layers thick, before being folded over and glued to make a hollow section. As always, everything looked promising before I began, but once the time to test arrived, the outcome was entirely predictable. So it seems clear to me that if I'm going to make a 3D printed aircraft, I need someone else to design it. Previously, I discovered Eclipson 3D printed RC airplanes, and the product they sell is exactly as it sounds. You download the SDL files and then you print the parts before assembling the plane. And importantly for me, 
When I inevitably crash the plane, I can print spares and get myself up in the air as soon as possible. There's multiple categories, but I went for one of the trainers, specifically the Model C. Despite having a wingspan of more than a meter, you only need a small 3D printer to print the files. I purchased this some time ago, all of the SDLs are included, as well as pre-sliced G-code for an Ender 3. So to get this one happening, I just need to order some lightweight PLA and then get printing. I'm keen to see if this design is foolproof and can overcome my previous record. Finally, a project that's been going since 2014 and has recently been sitting unloved on the back veranda. What you're seeing here is a modified home injection molding machine. I purchased it in 2014 from the United States from Jacobs Mold and Machine, and this meant it was meant to run on 115 volts. I changed the heating elements to suit 240 volts and added on this cheap PID controller. This was so long ago, however, that I can't even remember how to use it. As well as bolting it to this base with handle, I added a 12 volt power supply to power the compressor sitting above. Using this means the machine is portable and I don't need a larger shop compressor. The compressor output attaches to a regulator on top of the chamber. This chamber has a tight seal and once you release it, you can see inside and this is where you pour in the plastic you want to injection mold. On the underside of the lid is a stirrer, which can slide down into the bottom of the melting pot, allowing you to stir when everything's sealed up. When you turn on the compressor, the chamber will become pressurized. You can then put your mold on the base, lining it up with the nozzle, use the handle to lower the nozzle down to the entrance, and then pull this handle to let the pressurized plastic flow into the mold. Well, at least that's how it should work, because mine is kind of seized from sitting around under the house at my old place. After rebuilding this aspect, I reckon I can try making molds with the Carbera CNC. The other option is to try resin printing the molds with some specialist high temperature resin. The machine is designed to be used with this two-part Plastisole soft plastic, however it can handle up to 204 degrees Celsius, this should be a great way to use up some of that recycled ground PLA. That's it from me, so now over to you. I've outlined a range of projects for the channel, and I'd love to read about which ones interest you most, as well as any suggestions you have on how I can make these projects better. So please fire up your keyboard and head down to the comment section. Thank you so much for watching both this video or any of the other videos you might have watched in the last five years. I really appreciate your support. Until next time, happy new years and happy finishing long-term projects. G'day, it's Michael again. If you like the video, then please click like. If you want to see more content like this in future, click subscribe and make sure you click on the bell to receive every notification. If you really want to support the channel and see exclusive content, become a patron. Visit my Patreon page. See you next time.